we'll make the starts. There might be a few other people that trickle in. Um, but yes, welcome everyone. Um, this is a welcome and introduction to higher education through the space, so support, supporting parents and carers and education sessions. So the first few slides I'll talk through what the um, programme will look like and then we'll get talking about higher education. Oh, just, there we go. Okay, so um, there's a few pictures on here, but I wouldn't worry too much about them today. Um, but we have Asim here today. I'm here, but also I have my colleagues, Jess and Joe, who will be talking in a moment. Um, and then also we have Jess from the um, Oxford Brooks University, a student ambassador, to talk you through um, what it's like being, or to ask questions about what it's like being a student. Um, so yeah, welcome to Space. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I am a higher education liaison officer um, with Study Higher and I'm here to support you through the programme. So SPACE is a virtual programme designed to help you learn how you can best support your young person through education and secondary school, help, you help them with their exams and understand more about higher education and apprenticeships. So it's a free programme um, and it's working with Oxford Brooks University and Study Higher. So Study Higher is a partnership with universities, further education colleges and other stakeholders working together to provide young people with high quality and partial advice. So we work with year nines to year, uh, year tens to year thirteens, and we support them on their journey and um, through lots of different workshops, events, mentoring, um, virtual sessions like these and so on. So how will the space programme look? <clears throat> so you will have email links sent out weekly. Um, so you join by the Zoom link, they're usually around one hour with the 30 minute slot for um, Q&A. Um, there is an option um, at, on the bottom of Zoom to use the chat function. Please use that as much as you can. It's only us who can see the questions or um, comments that you put in the chat section. And there are no silly questions, so feel free to ask any questions that you have. Um, don't worry if you miss a session, we also will be uploading these onto our YouTube and onto our website at the end of all of this. So um, don't worry if you feel like you can't attend a session or you've got something crop up, that's totally okay. Um, so on the screen, you can see the sessions that will be taking place. So today we have a welcome and introduction to higher education. On the 7th of February, we have how to apply. 21st of February, student finance, uh, 28th of February, apprenticeships and vocational routes. And then the 7th of March, we have a student panel. Um, so yeah, you can also drop us an email through the space email, which you would have received an email from today. Um, if you have any further questions following the session and you forgot to ask them, that's absolutely fine. Just to let you know, the sessions are recorded. Um, don't worry about that. Um, because you won't be able to see your face or your names. Um, so it's all um, anonymous in that way. So um, that's fine. I do just need to let you know that they are, it is being recorded. So that's pretty much how space will work. So I wanted to start with a poll to begin with. Um, so if I just get those up, just to ask you some questions about how you're feeling about university and higher education information. So there's four questions and you tick strongly Strongly disagree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree? You can just answer those for me, please. Got a few of you answering, brilliant. So I'll ask you these questions at the start and then hopefully, fingers crossed, by the end of the session, you'll feel slightly more confident um, with some of these questions. And then we can use those answers to help us tailor the next sessions to give you the most support. OK, so six out of nine, I think that pretty much everyone.
Okay, I'll give you sort of 30 more seconds or so in case anybody else would like to answer. Okay, so that's a good confident answer on here, which is great. Um, but there's a couple of things hopefully we can cover today that will help. Okay, 10 more seconds, and I think we'll round that part up. And then we'll we ask these questions at the end um, to see how more confident you feel, like I said. Okay. Um, I don't really need to share the results as such, but um, but it's good for us to know where we're at. Um, so let's go back to where we were. So let's have a little chat about what we'll be covering today. Um, so today is an introduction to HE. So we're starting to think about what are the routes into higher education? What are the different types of study? Um, choosing a university, choosing a course, and thinking about what you can do outside of your academic stomach studies to help you with your applications and your career going forward, um, or your young persons going forward. Um, so I'm just going to pass over to my colleague Jo now, who's going to speak about the routes into university. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, so my name's Jo. I'm going to talk to you about the different routes into kind of higher education. Um, so I'm guessing, um, so they're basically split into different levels from level two um, right the way up to um, level seven. Um, and I'm guessing most of your young people would either be studying level two GCSE um, or kind of about to study it, or maybe they've already kind of finished GCSE and they're doing like A-levels or something at college. Um, but I will just go through the difference. So the start of is level two. Um, so when your young person has achieved um, five grades um, four and above um, they will have a full level two qualification um, so they need to get the at least five GCSEs at grade four and above to achieve a full level two qualification um, so from that they can progress on to level three um, if something happens and they they don't manage to achieve those grades straight away um, at GCSE um, if they get lower, um, they can study something like a level two BTEC at college for a year um, and then progress on to level three afterwards. Um, so with level three, um, you've got your kind of traditional A levels, which probably most of you are aware of. Um, they run very similar to GCSE. Students tend to choose three subjects um, and they would study them over two years and, and sit exams at the end of each year. Um, and then we have vocational qualifications um, and there's two different vocational qualifications. One which you're probably most of you have heard of is BTEX. Um, so these have been around for a number of years um, and BTEX uh, are, tend to be in um, subjects where there's um, employment involved. So they're kind of relating directly to an industry. Um, so they can be in anything from things like engineering um, to hairdressing and, and kind of everything in between. Um, and it's like computing. With a BTEC, um, you do mostly, um, you would kind of assess through coursework. So students would do um, lots of coursework. They'd have to do lots of practical assessments. So there'd be kind of skills that they'd have to learn um, as part of that, um, that subject they're teaching. For an example, if they were doing motor vehicle, they would need to learn how to do an MOT or an oil change um, and they'd get assessed on, on that. And, and that would form part of their results. Um, and the final element would be um, some exams, but um, not, not massive exams. They tend to be like multiple choice or, or very kind of short answer exams in a BTEC. Um, and then the other vocational route, uh, which is relatively new, it's been around for about three years now. I think it's just gone into its fourth year um, and they're called T-levels. Um, T-levels have been put together um, by the um, government and employers working together. And you can only study a T-level in a kind of subject where there's going to be jobs in the future. So they've kind of identified where all the skill shortage is going to be. So either there's an aging population or it's kind of new skills that people need to learn and kind of realise where they're going to have shortage of people to do jobs in the future and put together these T-levels. 
and employers have kind of really inputted into um, the T levels. They kind of inputted what the young people need to learn to be able to get jobs in the industry going forward. Um, so T levels, they do an element of, so similar to the BTEC, they will do some kind of vocational um, um, practical stuff in kind of workshops or in classrooms. Um, one day a week, they will be spending doing work experience. So they need to get a job in industry um, for one day a week or so 20% of their time needs to be in work. Um, and then there's some elements of exams as well. So it's kind of a T levels, a bit of a, like a combination between a B tech and A level um, with adding in the element of work experience. And then the final route at level three is um, an advanced apprenticeship. So um, apprenticeships, you probably know, are where students can gain a qualification whilst working at the same time. So it's the opposite to T-levels. So with an apprenticeship, uh, young people would be in work 80% of the time, um, and then they would be studying um, kind of their college work 20% of the time. So that's usually uh, one day a week in college, um, and four days a week with their employer. Um, and there's lots of different subjects you can study and apprenticeships in. There's things like teaching, um, aeronautical engineering, health and social care, um, lots and lots of different options that I think we'll probably go into when we do the session on apprenticeships later on in the programme. Um, with most apprenticeships, even if you get um, a, your great level two qualifications, because you're learning a brand new skill, um, you quite often have to start on a level two apprenticeship. So you start on what they call an intermediate apprenticeship and then progress on to this, the advanced. That's basically because you're learning brand new skills. And the best way I could describe is, is that if you were going to a hairdresser's to have your hair cut, um, you wouldn't want somebody cutting your hair just because they've got really good um, results and learned from a book how to cut hair. You'd want somebody who'd been practicing for a year on one of the fake head dolls and learn how to cut hair properly before you kind of let loose on your hair. So that's kind of why most people start on the level two apprenticeship and progress onto level, level three. There's some exceptions, things like accounting and business apprenticeships. Um, if you get good GCSE results, you can go straight onto those. So those are the kind of level two, level three, and that takes your young person up to 18. So anything above the level three is known as higher education. Uh, the most common higher education that you will all know about is um, a degree, which you can study at university. I'm going to go into a bit more details about that um, in the next slide. Um, we've also got um, foundation degrees. We can do degree and higher apprenticeships. Um, and there's the thing um, called higher national certificates and higher national diplomas. Um, these tend to be studied by um, adults more than young people because you have to be kind of working to be able to study a higher national certificate. So you can study them in things like um, computing and, and engineering, um, but most people kind of working in the industry um, want to get a promotion or something at work, need an extra qualification and would study them one day a week. So a higher national certificate is a level four. And then once you finish the HNC, you can progress to a HNC and get a level five. But if we pop onto the next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail about the other HE routes. <coughs> okay, so we've got our honours degree. So this is a kind of traditional university route. Um, so most students, if you go to university, you would study an honours degree. Um, these are usually uh, three or four years, um, depending whether it's something called a sandwich year or a sandwich course, which isn't anything to do with sandwiches. It's basically um, students would do their first and second year, and then in their third year, they would get a job and um, work in industry for a year, get lots of work experience, and then come back and do their final year. Whilst the students who don't do their sandwich year, they would do just one year one, year two, and then go straight into their final year. Um, and obviously they're studied at lots of different universities across the country. So we have something called a foundation course. Um, then um, that's basically a level three, so not technically higher education, but it's a one year course um, that basically if your young person hasn't quite got the grades um, to get onto the degree they want to go onto, 
Um, some subjects such as art, for example, offer something called a foundation year. So you study um, at the university, but it's for one year, it's a level three, and then it basically gives you, um, if you pass that course, it will give the young person um, a, a definite place in the, on the course, the degree the following year. So that's kind of an option if the young person doesn't get the very specific grades they need to start with. <coughs> and we have a foundation degree. Um, so foundation degrees tend to be studied at um, like local FE colleges. Um, they are essentially the first two years of a full degree. So you'll study um, level year one and year two, and as a, and you can kind of graduate with a foundation degree. Um, they're a lot more practical based, so they tend to be on kind of work focused subjects. Um, so things like business, and um, you can do accounting, you can do um, kind of health therapies and foundation degrees. Um, they're definitely kind of more work focused. Um, you can, for example, do a foundation degree in geography or history or anything like that. That's more kind of academic. Um, so once you finish your two years, yep, yeah, you will have a complete um, higher education qualification. You'll have a level four and a level five course qualification. But if you wanted to, um, most of the colleges, their foundation degree programs are uh, linked to universities. So you can go to university for one year and top it up to a full degree as an option. And then our final kind of higher education option are higher and degree apprenticeships. So they run very similar to the intermediate and the advanced apprenticeships I was talking about earlier. Um, whilst you'd be working four days a week, studying for one day a week. Um, a, high, a higher apprenticeship is any apprenticeship that's level four, five or six. So it can be just a level four or it can be a combination of level four or five um, or it can be a combination of level four, five or six. So kind of any combination of those. A degree apprenticeship is a full degree. So you would study level four, level five and level six and it'll be attached to a university. Um, so the kind of degree apprenticeships are linked to universities. You'd study exactly the same kind of course um, as if you're at university. It would obviously take you a lot longer. It takes you about five years to complete a degree apprenticeship because you're working 80% of the time. And then if you're studying a higher ed um, qualification, you're most likely to study something like a HNC, a HND, or a foundation degree as the qualification part of your course. Uh, shall we go to the next slide? We've got a little, we can type in the chat for our next slide. How many um, higher education providers do you think there are in the UK? So when your young person gets to kind of 18 and deciding how many, if you can type in the chat, just to guess, nobody can see. Yeah, the chat's just at the bottom by where the polls were earlier. So if anybody can just type some guesses in there. Okay, a couple of guessing coming through. Do you want to reveal the answer, Marissa? <laughs> So there's 395. So there's 395 different kind of HE providers that um, young people can choose from. Um, so lots and lots of choice um, for people to go. Um, on the next slide, there's just a handful of examples of the kind of universities across the kind of UK. So we've got like um, Oxford, uh, Bristol, we've got um, University of London, Loughborough, um, Birmingham City, so there's lots of different ones, um, and we've got some in Scotland and Wales as well. So our next slide, um, and this does uh, kind of, where do you fit? I think, does your um, mouse button work, Marissa, if you hover over the map? Just having a little go at it, I'm wondering if the... Oh, uh, okay, no. So, um, oh, okay, so you can, can you see my mouse? No. No. Okay. okay. So I think we just need to guess where well, we think. Yeah, we'll just have to kind of guess in your head where you think um, the, unit, the, um, the next university is. So it will come up um, to we didn't to show the first one. Yeah, we, that one sort of came up, didn't it? So that's yeah. the University okay. of Aberdeen. So the next circle is 
Oh, yeah. Where do you think the University of Liverpool would be? So, yeah, think in your head and then we'll reveal the answer. And then, yeah, see how, how well you did. We'll ask you at the end how many you got out of seven. Yeah, so do you want to reveal them? Yeah, so the University of Liverpool is more in the middle. And then we've got University of Nottingham. We'll give about 10 to 20 yeah. seconds on each. That there. And I'm not sure if it's 100% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't trust the pinpoint accuracy of it. If you think Nottingham's a bit higher than that, then I think you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> we've got Queen's University, Belfast. That's one's in Northern Ireland. And then I think there's one more. Might be a couple more. Swansea University. I know it's somewhere in Wales, but yeah, 100% sure by the sea, I'm guessing, like on the coast. Let's have a little look. Yeah, you're right. Oh, right well done. <laughs> I don't but know if there's any others. Just have a quick look. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's Oxford Brooks University. I should know where that is because I work there. <laughs> Which is about there. <laughs> Perfect. So that's just kind of giving you a, like a brief kind of idea. Was that the last one, Marika? Yeah. Yes. Uh, kind of yeah. a rough idea that that literally is universities across the whole of the UK. Um, and your young person, if they decide university is the HE route for them, and um, there's lots of different kind of options for them. Um, I think we're going to hand over to Jess now, yeah. who's going to talk through more about the university options. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, so yes, there are lots of different types of universities and universities are all built differently and work in slightly different ways because of the way that they're built. So on the screen, you can see that the University of Oxford is known as what's called a collegiate university. And this means that the university is split into different colleges for different subjects. So each of those colleges will be based across different parts of Oxford City. And they kind of act as like mini universities in themselves. Each of the colleges will have their own halls of accommodation, their own dining halls, um, teaching spaces, um, things like that. And they try to group students who are doing similar subjects for each of those colleges around the city. We've also got campus-based universities. Um, University of Leeds is an example of a singular campus where literally everything is all in one place. So you'd have your accommodation, your lecture halls, your student union, all in one campus within Leeds. Um, Oxford Brooks is a multiple campus university, so they've got different campuses spread out across Oxford, but also perhaps some multiple campuses are based in different cities. We've got um, for Oxford Brooks, for example, we have campuses in Oxford, but we also do have one in Swindon. Um, so you might see that that type of university is split across lots of different locations and when that is the case universities try to make it as easy as possible for students to travel between different campuses um, so Oxford Brooks and lots of universities have their own um, Oxford um, bus and university bus that will travel to the different campuses or the different facilities different halls of accommodation to make sure that students can get to those different places really easily. Um, and then we've also got city based universities like Birmingham, um, where the campus is spread across the city. Um, so you might have the student accommodation in one part of the city, um, lecture theatres for certain subjects in another place, student in another place, but they're all within one city, but just spread across that. Um, each type of campus works differently for different students. So when you or your young person are looking at universities and exploring what might be best for you, it might be important to just take into consideration what type of campus you might be looking for. Fab. Thanks, Marissa, for coming. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Um, and making that choice can be really, really difficult. Um, it's a really big decision to make. Um, you or your young person might be there for two, three years or more. Um, so making that decision is, is quite a big one. Um, but hopefully there are some ways here on the screen that can help you narrow down some of those options. So you might want to think about the reputation of the university, where they sit on a league table as a university themselves, or kind of where they rank based on specific subjects that you might be interested in. You might want to think about the atmosphere. So are the facilities good? Does the environment feel safe? Is it friendly? What do the buildings look like? Is it modern and fresh? Is there quiet space? Like what is the general vibe of the university? 
you might want to think about the size you might like something like a bigger campus which is full of people and a bit more hustle and bustle and have some more energy or you might like something that's a bit more secluded and quiet and a bit smaller looking at what the types of facilities they've got so do they have a library gym shops restaurants hairdressers some universities have dentists on site as well um so it's thinking about all the essentials that you or your young person might need while they're at university um like for example do they have a place where you can get a coffee before your 9am lecture or do they have a 24-hour library um which actually the library is a really big thing for lots of students that we work with um so kind of looking into what kind of things they've got on offer for you Thinking about the location, so as you saw on the map, there's lots of options about where you could choose to go to university. Um, you might want it to be close to home so you can come home, um, coming back to hand over your washing, or you might want to commute to university. So thinking about your travel time, um, is it in the city centre? Is it near the accommodation? Does it have good transport links? So all of those things kind of thinking about actually where the university is located. And also financial support. So we will look more into finance um, in another webinar as part of this series. But lots of universities have their own bursaries and scholarships, which are basically free pots of money that they've got available for eligible students. So when you're doing your research, it's a really good idea to kind of see and look on universities' websites to see if they've got um, bursaries or free scholarships and things that you or young, your young person might be eligible for and helping look at where you might want to study. Um, we recommend that so if you can, the best way to kind of get a sense of whether a university is right for you is to go and visit in person. And that for me was a huge key part of my decision of going to university. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted and I ended up going to Bath Spa, which was a quite a smaller campus, a smaller campus based uni. Um, it wasn't in the city centre, but it wasn't far away from home. It was perfect for what I wanted. And going to visit in person, perhaps at an open day or on a school trip, you really can get a vibe of whether that university is right for you and whether you would feel happy there. Um, and lots of universities actually have lots of support available as part of their open days. So if you have to travel by train, lots of universities can offer financial support in helping to pay towards your um, train ticket and things like that um, to help you get to an open day and actually experience what it is like to be on my campus and see if it's right for you. Thanks, Marissa. So what can you get out of going to university? Um, lots of different wonderful things on this screen here. A really big key part of this is growing your independence. Um, you might be moving away from home for the first time. You might be having to cook for yourself, clean, <laughs> and do your washing. Um, all of those things as well as maybe having to study independently um at university like teachers don't really chase you for your homework it's really up to you to manage your own time um and organize your your studying there is lots and lots of support available if you ever struggle with that but independence is a huge part of going to university um you'll get a chance to develop lots of transferable skills and um, personal development as well skills within your course but also just the experience of going to university and what that might be like you might want to apply to your future career or other areas in your life. You might develop in confidence and um, get the chance to meet like minded people, um, have challenging and interesting discussions, um, but also trying out new things. So new experiences, new friendships. You might go to new places, do different sports that you might not have had the chance to do before. Um, you can meet people from literally all walks of life at university. Um, and that might be something that you're really interested in and wanting to meet new people and kind of. Um, see what else you have in common with other people maybe not you're not even on the same course as you um as well as earnings so having a degree um qualifies you for higher paying jobs and gives you a better chance of getting um being more successful in competitive sectors um so there's just a couple of things really to think about um what you might want to get out of university but there might be other things that you've specifically got that you want to get out of university and just keeping that in mind um when you're researching as well Brilliant. Thanks, Marissa. So with that in mind, lots of things to consider, but how many different courses do you think there are to pick from for an undergraduate level? Um, and again, if you want to pop some of your thoughts in the chat, feel free. Feel free. Um, so how many courses do you think there are to pick from to study at undergraduate level? <laughs> awesome. OK. Brilliant, Marissa. Do you want to reveal the answer? Thank you. So there are actually 50,000 courses to choose from. And if you or your young person are considering university, that is a lot to choose from, right? <laughs> and it can be really, really daunting. Um, 
but it's just really important to remember that a history course at the University of Leeds might be different or will be different to a history course at the University of Reading and both of those count as a separate course and those things like that is what feed into the number of 50,000. So um, again, that is something that perhaps as part of your research, you might want to look at the content of the course and we're gonna talk about courses in a moment. Um, but may, when making that decision, you might want to think about your favorite subjects so what you've been enjoying in school or college, but also maybe what you enjoy outside of school and college as well, where are your interests and, and what do you enjoy? Um, some jobs don't require a specific degree, but they just require you to have a degree. Um, so if you're perhaps a bit confused or you're not really sure what to study, but you know you want to go to university, we, we often recommend that it's important to think about something that you would be passionate about or you could be committed to studying um, because you are giving up potentially three years of your life to study a subject. Um, so having an interest in that is always good. Um, even if you go to university and you've made your choice and you get on your course and you think, oh, no, this this actually isn't for me. I, I'm not enjoying it. You do have the option to change when you get there as well. So but just keeping that in mind of thinking about the things that you enjoy. Um, you might have a specific career in mind and you might know that actually you need a degree or a higher level qualification to pursue um, that career. So, for example, like being a nurse or a midwife or a doctor, you kind of know that you have to have some form of higher level qualification. Um, to go into that sector, or you might want to try something completely new. <laughs> um, you might want to try something that you've never had the chance to study before, um, or you've, something you've never heard of. It could be linked to subjects that you're studying right now or interests that you have, but it might not. And it could be something where you would just like to have the opportunity to learn more about um, and explore. So I hope that's been helpful in kind of thinking about how you might choose your university lots of different information but there's also lots of support out there for you um not just from study higher but from lots of different organizations and um, teachers as well um so yeah i hope that helps over to you marissa thank you jess um yeah so i'm going to talk more about courses and within courses and what's important to look out for um, so this slide's talking about course structure, um, and I think it's really important to consider that. So thinking about um, the modules within the course structure and how those modules work and the credits work. Um, so there might be particular um, modules that stick out to you when or your young person when they're thinking about applying. Um, so I knew when I went to um, study for the course that I decided to do, there was a volunteering element within one of the modules, which I thought was really important because it's really frustrating when you finish university and go to apply for jobs and they still want you to have experience, of course. So having an element of volunteering or work experience was really important to me. Um, so thinking about what modules are interesting and on each of the courses that you're looking at or your young person is looking at. And all of this information can be found um, within a prospectus for the university or on or on the university website. Also, the length of the course. So most, um, as which has been mentioned um, throughout this session, most university courses are around three years. Um, there are some that are longer, for example, for um, medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and something along those lines can be um, usually around five, six or seven years. Um, but usually they're around three years. Sometimes they can be four years, as mentioned by Joe earlier in the course. You um, could have a sandwich course where you could have a year of employment or you could have a year abroad. So between the second and third year, you would have that space where you have a year traveling abroad or a year within industry. Um, so those are um, courses to consider. Um, and then also there is the combined and joint degrees um, option. So I did actually did this myself. So I studied English literature combined with sociology. So in my first year, my degree was 50-50. And then I decided in the second year to split it 75-25. Um, but that was just my opinion. I found the English side of it really challenging um because it is a big step up from a level although i enjoyed it there was lots and lots of reading so and i i, I realized that i enjoyed the sociology aspect of the course more so i tried i decided to split it 75 25 in my second year which is also an option for your third year as well so if you have a young person who's a bit unsure what they want to do 
or um yeah that that combined or jo joint honors degree is a really good option um so there's also the teaching style to consider so um some courses will be um only lectures and seminars so a lecture you probably know already is where you'd have a big group of people and you'd have the lecturer at the front of the session most likely delivering information and uh, a powerpoint on the the topic that you're covering and your young person would take notes from that and then the seminar would follow the lecture where there would be a much smaller amount of people in the class so it might be as small as like five to ten people up to like 20 to 30 people but much smaller than a lecture for example and that gives um the class um, time to debate, do worksheets and to um, focus on the topic at hand, ask any questions and things like that. And then lab work that comes into lots of subjects or like STEM subjects. Um, so I had a friend at university, I did um, English Lit and Sociology, as I said, and I would be in uni um, sort of 12 hours, 15 hours a week, whereas my friend who studied biology would be in like 20 to 30 hours a week, but that's because she had two, three hours of lab work, for example. And that comes into contact time. Um, so how often, um, you know, it's unlikely that you'll be there nine till five. So it's good to figure out how much time you'll be in lessons and how independent you need to be outside of the session. So I think that was a big kick in the teeth for me when I went to university, that although I was only in 10 to 12 hours a week, a lot of the time, out of um, sort of uh, lectures and seminars, I had to be doing my own independent reading, my own independent research, my own writing of the essays, and I had to encourage myself to do that myself. So, um, yeah, it's, it's thinking about how much independence your young person wants within within university. Um, but I will say, being at university, as Jess said, it, it does grow your independence massively. Um, so yeah, and then there's assessments and class sizes. So the assessments and contact time and the way the teaching style works will all be on the university website. So it would give you an idea of how much time they would be in um, weekly and how the assessments are set out. So for me, um, it was um, mainly um, ass assessments or so assignments throughout the year. So writing essays. And at the end of the year, I had exams. It might be for some courses, like for law, for example, where they have um, exams throughout the year. Um, so it's also good to consider how they want to be assessed. Is it through um, assess assignments and coursework type work, or is it through um, doing more field research, or is it through exams and things like that? And I think class size goes back to what Jess was talking about, the size of the university. So as Jess said, going to visit the universities when open days come around is the best thing to do, um, because I realised exactly the same. I went and visited a few universities, some campus style, some city based universities, um, and I went and visited Brighton, um, which was very small classes. Um, which was useful for me to know. And then when I ended up going to Manchester Met for my first year um, back in 2014, and the lecture halls were huge. They were like what you would see in a movie, um, whereas Brighton, it was much smaller. So that's something to consider how important class size is to you and whether you were not too bothered about it or whether you prefer that more close-knit um, support, basically, I think. But I think the idea of the independence is really important to take away as well. Um, so yeah, outside of act academic activities. Um, so there is so much going on at university. Um, so you've got things like opportunities to do part-time work and volunteering, but also trips and clubs and societies. So um, it could be that you have a part-time job working at local um, shop or a local pub or restaurant for or your young person does however there is opportunities to be a student ambassador which is I think 
really useful to point out to your young person when they come to go to university and Jess who is on the call today not the Jess who just spoke another Jess um who will be able to talk at the end who is a current student she is a student ambassador and basically what happens is they go and support events such as these I went to a university today and they had student ambassadors running the tour for example and there was lots of students there from a school in Swindon and they showed them around the university and they get paid for it and it's really good for their CV, really good for their application forms. And they sometimes can win awards at the end of their time at university for being a student ambassador. So there is opportunities within the university. So some universities might offer um, part-time roles working as a cashier in the um, canteen or in the library or something along those lines. So it's always useful to look for part-time work. I would recommend not working too much though, because it's important to make sure that they get all the work done as well. But clubs and societies, I'm actually going to um, move on to the next slide to talk about this because it does mention it on here. And there is a video for me to show as well. Um, but societies is, is a huge part of university. Um, so I'm going to show the um, YouTube video. So just give me two moments while I do this because I just have to swap screens and everything. So just two secs. It's all about. Right, two seconds, guys. Let's just make sure that it was up okay. Share screen. Here we go. Share screen. Hopefully, you can see that okay. Yeah, okay, so hopefully you can hear it okay. So this is a video released by Oxford Bridge University, and this is um, talking about their sports and societies that they have. Um, I'm just going to reshare the presentation, but while I do that, um, yeah, hopefully that gave you a good insight into the types of societies that could be on offer at university. So that is only for um, Oxford Brooks, and that's their video that you can see on um, YouTube, um, but there's lots of different ones that you can find on YouTube as well that relate to certain universities. Um, but yeah, the, 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 there's so many that your young person could take part in. And I think anybody that um, 
is within higher education would offer the same advice that you know if there's an interest that they they already take up or would like to try something new at university then through societies is the best way to learn new skills meet new people um, and enjoy something extracurricular and that takes their mind off of um studying um so yeah that they usually are a small fee for them um but that's all to think about when when they go off to university but they are brilliant and there's so many different ones that they could take up um, and there's no limit on how few or how many they want to do. Then you've got the Students' Union. So that is where there's an option to host events and things like that. They can also give advice, but they usually organise events. So there's things like events for freshers. Um, there's also a vintage clothing sale that they often have at Oxford Brooks University. Um, they might hold like sort of like discos or like bar nights or comedy nights or those sorts of things. And there's always lots of events and fun things going on. And then there's the accommodation. Um, so there's lots of different options of accommodation when it comes to university. And that's something for you and your young person to look at and consider when the time comes. But there's things like non-catering or catered options. There's ensuite or there's shared bathrooms with 13 people. Um, it might be that you have um, just four people within a flat or up to 20 people. Um, there are so many different options and th there's um, there's an option for everyone essentially and they are they, they do vary in price um, so it might be that catered options with an ensuite are, are more expensive than a non-catered um, without an ensuite for example and it might be based on how close they are in terms of location to the university. But yeah, so the next slide is a video. So I'm just going to stop sharing and get that one up again. Um, so this is a tour of the university. Um, so there's so much to consider when you're thinking about universities. So my advice, as I said, is always go to the open days. But you can sometimes find some mini, mini tours on YouTube. But my advice is always go there in person. But this is just an example of um, the Headington campus tour at Oxford Brooks. So just give me two moments again. Hopefully you can see this okay.
I think I've pretty much finished there on that video. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, but that was an example of um, a YouTube video of a campus tour. And as you can see, Brooks is huge. Um, I'm going to reshare the screen. Yeah, Brooks is huge. And when I first went there, I, I didn't realise how big it is because you can, when you're stood in front of it, you can't see how much there is behind like the field and the accommodation. And yeah, it's massive. So um, I think that's a really good, useful video to see. Um, yeah, and I just don't think we realise, do we, how big universities can be sometimes um, and how big their lecture theatres are and their libraries and accommodation and so on. Um, can you see this okay? Hopefully you can. Yeah. So um, we've only got a couple more slides to go. Um, so this is um, what you can what you can have have in students union. So representation. You can have societies. They're here to, they're to help you. They can offer you advice, inform information, and guidance, and so on. Um, so in terms of top tips for university um, for your young person, um, I think there's a huge list here. So being open to trying new experiencing, trying new experiences. So that might be signing up to a society that maybe they might not would have, would have done in school um, or six or more college. Practicing budgeting before university. Um, yeah, this one's a really good one, I thought. The learning to cook at least five meals from scratch. Um, my friend at university was amazing at cooking and we was only like 18 years old and she was so good and cooked some amazing meals every day. Whereas I lived on pasta for a lot of it. I remember my mum bought me the biggest thing of pasta I've ever seen in my life. Um, and when I spoke to some of the students at the event that I was at today, the student ambassadors, and we asked what their go-to meal was, most that was, pot noodles or mug noodles or pasta or rice and tuna and that sort of thing um so learning to cook um a few staple meals i think would be useful making the most of your first week academically and socially yep so figuring out where your seminars and your classes and your lectures will be who your lecture who their lectures are or should i say um also socially so going to events and things like that making most of the available, help available. So every university is different with what support they can offer. So I think when you go to visit on open days or look on and do your research, um, have a look what, what, what support and help they can offer. Always back up your work, yes. I remember actually being, um, writing our dissertations. I remember seeing some girl come in with her laptop and said that her all of her work that she'd lost, um, I think it was like 10,000 words of her dissertation she had lost. Um, I don't know if they ever got it back. I just remember overhearing her coming into the IT and saying, that um, you know, submit it, she needs to submit it in a few days and she thinks she's lost it. Hopefully it was on the hard drive somewhere. But yeah, always back up the work, put it onto a memory stick if they, people still use them nowadays, or advise your young person to use like an online um cloud or something like that so they can access it if something happens to their laptop or their computer. Join one society that's already a hobby and one that's completely new. Explore the city you live in. Yes. Um, so as I said, I lived in Manchester to begin with. And wow, that was a big city and there was so much to explore. And now I just love the city so much and want to go and visit. But it's around four or five hours from where I live. So it's quite far. Um, so, yeah, you know, if, if your young person decides to go London, Brighton, Manchester, Scotland, Wales, wherever it is, um, advise them to explore as much as they can. Um, and it's okay to stay in touch with home. Yes, um, everyone's different at university. I had a friend who went home every weekend um, because I live so far away. I only went home at the end of term because it was so expensive to get home. And I think that's another good thing to consider is how often will they want to come home? So maybe not thinking about going too far. Um, if they do want to go, go home sort of fortnightly, um, somewhere that's a bit closer might be better suited. Um, but it's okay to stay in touch with home and to go home when they want and to get washing done and have a home cooked meal. Um, definitely. But I think that's pretty much it. We have got a slide here on wellbeing. And then we'll move on to the Q&A part. So we have Jess here from Oxford Brooks, which I'll introduce in a minute. But I did just want to talk about this. The well-being it's so important at university and um, I think it's really important to consider how 
how each university looks at well-being which is such an important factor in all of our lives now um so this is um at oxford brooks they have dedicated facilities and teams that look after physical and mental health support for disabilities dyslexia support medical center including dentists on site free counseling facilities and multi-faith chaplaincy on site so i think that's really important to consider going forward um because we all need that well-being um and what support each university will offer you and your young person. But here's pretty much it from me. Um, I think, should we do the poll now? Um, so if we go back to the poll, so the questions that I asked you at the beginning of the session, I will re-ask you. Um, hopefully you feel more confident, but don't worry if not. So if I launch that. So it's the same four questions. And if you could just answer them. Strongly disagree, disagree, agree, and strongly agree. And then any questions, Jess from Oxford Brooks and us from Study High will hopefully help. Stop okay, I'll give a couple more minutes for that. Four out of seven have answered so far. Yeah, thank you for listening. Um, we now have an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. There's no silly questions. Um, you can pop them in the chat function, but I also notice there's a Q&A function at the bottom. Oh, hi, Jess. <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to ask anything. Have we had any questions come in, Asim? I think I've seen one. There has been one. Um, I have answered it, but just in case anybody can't see the Q&A, um, somebody asked, do study higher or other universities have data on employers' future, future strategy-led employees' demand? Um, and universities will have information on the website about undergrad employment rates and what they're going to do once they finish their degree. Um, they'll also have career services on site that can help um, students find work placements and work experience whilst they're studying, but also once they finish their degree as well. Um, and I've just mentioned a couple of websites in there like Career Pilot. And LMI for all can show you what's called labour market information, which tells you like what the demand might be for future careers um, in the future. So and again, we can we can send those links out as well via the space email if, if you'd like any more questions on that. Um, but I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, just to add to that, over the kind of last decade, universities have gone from very much focused on getting students a degree and passing the course and kind of result focused to um, teaching, to being more kind of employer focused and making sure student, this, every university course, degree course has like employability skills built, built into it. Every university will have, um, yeah, kind of days, weeks where they kind of get students to meet employers. So even if you're not doing the sandwich year where you get all that work experience, it isn't just about getting that qualification now. Um, all the courses and all the universities will link to employability skills. They'll all have links to employers and um, they'll work with their alumni, so people who used to go to the university who can come in and talk to students about employment opportunities. So it's very much like 10 years ago, I would say universities were very focused on get them in, get them their degree and get them out. And now it's very much kind of employer focus and training. They want to be able to train young people into, the, into their future careers and not just get them to pass their course. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Um, sorry, Jet, I'm just going to put you on the spot, Jess. I don't suppose you'd mind just sharing a little bit about um, the course you're studying and what year you're in and just sharing a little bit about your journey to uni. Would that be OK? Ooh, yeah. Jess. Um, so I'm Jess. I'm a third year geography and international relations student. So I do a joint degree. So I do like a 50 50 split of both subjects um, in terms of getting to uni. Um, I did 
GCSEs, then I did A-levels in a college. So I did maths, computer science and geography. And then I decided to go into human geography. So those A-levels didn't even matter. Um, but yeah, that's the sort of thing I'm doing now. Um, I'm not in any societies anymore because third year is a lot of work. So I'd like to concentrate on my work, but yeah. So what societies were, were you in? Um, at one point I was in the game society and we met up every week and did some stuff in the evening. Um, and then I was in the geography society, but then it like disbanded because there wasn't too much interest in, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Jess. Yeah, I guess last chance for any more questions. So if anybody's got any more questions, we'll give you another minute or so. Um, and then if not, I guess we can end it there. But you can email and um, there's an email addresses in there, Marissa, if they want if they want yeah. to ask questions outside of this kind of or if you think of something when you've um yeah, when you had time to absorb everything you've learned <laughs> so i will just pop the email um in the chat so i, I, I you all have it anyway in your emails but just in case oh asim's done it brilliant <laughs> um so yeah asim has popped in the chat the email in case anybody would like to drop any questions um feel free We have had another question come in. Um, what about LGBTQ plus support at university? Um, that's a really, really good question. And lots of different universities, a lot of that is often covered under their wellbeing services, where they have specific support for different groups of students. Um, but they might also have a range of different societies, like um, that, like Jess was talking about, that might be set up for themselves. Um, there are professional staff on site they have often lots of universities have counsellors and therapists as well as other student support teams um, who can help with a range of different um, issues or concerns that young people might have once they go to uni. Hope that helps. that might be it for questions <laughs> yeah hopefully we've answered what we can and hopefully the presentation answered lots of questions that you had um and hopefully you feel more confident now thinking about roots in higher education what opportunities there are what support there is and sort of where to look um i think our advice is always the university websites and then open days and things like that but um, there is more information to come in further sessions. So at the start of the session, I th showed you a list. So um, if you've signed up to one of them, hopefully you've signed up to one or two more. Um, and hopefully we will see you in the coming weeks. I think that's it from us, isn't it? So I think we're all okay to log off now. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Bye.